Hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, welcome back to our uh, Sabbath School uh, uh, lesson presentation uh, for series number 7, August 17, 2024. Now, we are now going to discuss the second half of the book of Mark. Uh, in chapter 8, it is the uh, first half of chapter 8 belongs to chapter uh, first section, and the second half of chapter 8 goes uh, is the beginning of the second section of the book of Mark. Now, uh, in, in, in our discussion today, uh, we are going to deal with the teachings, uh, teaching disciples part one. Uh, next week, we are going to deal with part two. But uh, in, uh, here, here is our key text today. When he had called the people to himself with his disciples, also he said to them, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Uh, but before we move on here, let's begin with a prayer. The Lord this morning, we thank you again for uh, <clears throat> the opportunity and the uh, uh, importance of the lesson that we are going to discuss today. And as we present this in space, uh, the, the, that uh, as we go through the details and uh, the importance of uh, your teaching, uh, especially uh, with the disciples in, the, in your time, may it be, Lord, that uh, uh, we will learn something out of this that will apply in our uh, experience with you growing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so uh, the, the idea of this lesson is, uh, of course, uh, uh, he, uh, what, will, what will it be rising from the dead? You know, in uh, Mark uh, 19, and the disciples could understand it from Jairus' daughter who had died, but Jesus was the Messiah. He had not come to die, but to reign. These words of Jesus must have had a spiritual meaning the thought, something like being born again. And so uh, uh, <clears throat> the disciples had a clear concept of what the Christ should do that made it difficult for Jesus to explain to them that this was that so, that his mission was different, that he had that to come, that he had not come to establish an earthly kingdom, but the way to glory passed through the cross. And so the disciples had to learn something very, very difficult in this time. So we are going to deal with teachings in the two phases, the basic instruction in Mark chapter 8, verse 20 to 30, and then the full knowledge in Mark 8, 31 to 38, and then the teachings about the kingdom, the future and the present kingdom, the largest in the kingdom, and how to enter the kingdom. So that is uh, what we're going to deal today. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> all of us uh, have transition points in our lives, leaving home for the first time, graduating from school, getting a first job, getting married, the birth of a child, a promotion, and the death of a loved one. And these moments are memorable because they represent a shift in who we are and our understanding of life. So we celebrate them when they represent hope and progress. We mourn them when they represent loss. And so the Gospel of Mark is fairly evenly divided into two main sections, uh, chapter 1 to 8 and chapter 8 to 16. And its turning point occurs in chapter 8, shifting from the emphasis on who Jesus is to focus on where he is going. Uh, this transition was not an easy one for the disciples to process because it did not meet their expectations. Jesus was going to Calvary destination. They never dreamed would be appropriate for him. So, uh, in the teachings, uh, in the in two phases, the transition to the second half, half of the uh, Gospel of Mark is introduced in an unusual way, and it relates to the story of unique Mark and the story of the healing of a blind man 
Of course, Jesus often healed the blind in his ministry, Bartimaeus. So let's look at the text here. And uh, so our uh, teachings in two phases. And so uh, let's look at uh, the, bear, the, the question and answer text or the Sunday section, seeing clearly. Now, why is the miracle of healing the blind so significant in Mark 8, 22 to 30? Why did it take Jesus two touches to heal the blind man? What lessons can we learn from this story? And so uh, uh, let, let's look at the text. Mark 8, 22 to 30. They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside of the village. And when they had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, Do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. So once more Jesus put his hands on man's eyes, then his eyes were opened. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. And Jesus sent him home saying, Don't even go into the village. And so what is unusual here is that he does not complete the healing, uh, the, the healing of the blind for the first attempt. Rather, uh, he, he heals the man. He asks him what he sees. Uh, but they took, they, they, see, according to him, they look like trees in verse 24. And so uh, Jesus touches the man's eyes again, and then he sees clearly. And what is going on here is the question. It seems that this is an acted parable that illustrates the process of the disciples uh, coming to understand better Jesus' mission and their own discipleship. In spite of seeing and hearing Jesus, witnessing and even performing miracles and experiencing the wonders of the kingdom, his disciples stubbornly resist appropriating the good news of God's remarkable kingdom in, a, in, an, in an apparent frustration, Jesus asks, Do you have eyes and fail to see? And do you have ears and fail to hear? And do you not remember? Because Jesus was asking them, The miracles that I have performed, miracles upon miracles and upon miracles, and still, you know, you do not understand, you do not see. There is a frustration in there. Although the disciples have seen, heard, even participated in divine power in God's incipient but growing kingdom, they do not understand. They are blind. So the, 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 the miracle here that, is going, that Jesus is performing is an acted miracle. Uh, it says here that uh, uh, Jesus trying to hard to heal them. In the next crucial middle section of the gospel, 8.22 and uh, uh, in verse, they came to Bethsaida and begged Jesus and 1052 Mark explores what lies at the heart of this blindness and unwillingness and unwillingness to see and the healing of this blind man illustrates how the disciples are learning little by little just who Jesus is and what it means to follow him so uh, seeing clearly, and here is uh, the text, the following text, again, in, 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 in connection to the story. Uh, uh, to the verse, Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked them, Who do people say I am? And they replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked. Who do you see I am? And Peter answered, You are the Messiah. And Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. And so Jesus, from the beginning of the Gospel of Mark, makes it clear that Jesus is the Messiah. In Mark 1.1, however, uh, the, the characters in the Gospel account, other than demon-possessed people, do not recognize who he is. You remember in the demon possessed, the, the, the demon, you know, interacted with Jesus Christ. 
and appealed to him, even pleaded with him not to kick them out. And so, uh, and then recognized him that he is the son of God. And yet, uh, you know, the, the disciples didn't understand really that the fact gives us insight that the in characters in the first half of the gospel did not have. Our vantage point helps us see what is taking place in the narrative and how the disciples progress toward a deeper understanding of who Jesus is. But in Mark 27 to 30, right here in the slide, the curtain is drawn aside when Jesus solemnly asks, who do people say I am? He says, who do people say, do you say I am? Verse 29. And of course, uh, 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 who do, uh, the, the disciples respond with some of the people's mistaken views of Jesus. And uh, of course, but when Jesus continues with the true questions of discipleship, but what about you? You see, what about you in verse 29? He asked, and so who do you say I am? And it is Peter who responds with a clarion confession, you are the Messiah, says in verse 29. And so <clears throat> uh, we might think that at this point Jesus would say, that is right, spread the news. But instead he tells his disciples in verse 30, he warned them not to tell any about him. And this command may seem baffling to us, in the 21st or 22nd century. But in the first century, claiming to be a Messiah had political overtones that were dangerous. And, of course, uh, for a person making the claim, this explains Jesus' command on historical level. To make an open proclamation of this truth would be as to certain his ministry. But on a theological level, the call for the secrecy has a different focus. Throughout Mark, we see a revelation of secrecy side by side with a revelation of who Jesus is, where Jairus and the woman with the hemorrhage illustrate a revelation and secrecy. He starts in public but ends in secrecy. He star she starts in secrecy and tells the crowd becomes public here in Mark 8, it is no different. Jesus had just been revealed and confessed as the Messiah, but it must be kept for the time being. As for the Gospel of Mark, progresses, the truth emerges, along with the disciples' responsibility to proclaim the good news about the risen Lord. So the conversation starts with Jesus' question concerning his identity and some disciples' voice the sentiment of there is a difference of opinion among the people concerning who Jesus is and what mission is. Others among Christ's disciples identify Jesus as the work of John the Baptist or some of the prophets. And Jesus' question to his disciples does not imply that Jesus doesn't know who he is. Rather, he wants to highlight the purpose of his life on earth and desires to be his disciples to understand his mission firsthand. And for this reason, after Peter's answer, you are the Christ or the Messiah, in verse 29, Jesus begins to reveal some future milestone of his journey. Peter identifies Jesus as Ho Christos in Greek, the Christ or the Messiah, with the article, the Messiah, the anointed one. And so... Uh, Jesus' messiahship in harm is, is in harmony with the eschatological perspective of the gospel. Remember in the prophecy of Daniel, where the two, uh, with, with the 2,490 days, I mean, uh, that Jesus is going to uh, come up as a messiah. He was the chosen one whom God had sent to redeem Israel. However, when Peter confessed, you are the Messiah or you are the Christ, he has a different expectation of Jesus as the Messiah. And that's why Jesus says, not yet. Do not tell anybody yet because it is politically dangerous and theologically risky. And so uh, that is really the essence of uh, our discussion today. <coughs> Basic instruction says, the healing recorded in Mark 8, 26 is 
the strangest of those performed by Jesus. In the first phase, man is able to see blurred. In the second phase, finally see clearly. This miracle serves as a parable of the way in which Jesus was going to instruct his disciples, preparing them to grasp the best of possible the reality of his saving mission. And so in the first phase, the disciples had come to the conclusion that Jesus was the Christ. To secure the truth in their minds, Jesus led them to declare it is asking them an indirect question and a direct questions. But they were, they were to remain silent regarding this statement for they had not yet understand its full implications. Wow. And so that is uh, restoring uh, the sight becomes a metaphor for insightful discipleship. That is really the gist of our discussion on this section. Now, on a Monday section, on Monday section, the cost of discipleship. The question is, what does the story of Mark 8, 31 to 30 teach us about the cost of following Christ? Where in this section do you see loss, gain, and repentance? It is obvious that Jesus is not leading us on a pleasant afternoon walk and that the kingdom of God does not mean merely a few minor adjustments in our ordinary lives. Now, take a look at the text. In Mark 8, 31 to 38, He did began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have, an, you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him along with the disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciples must deny themselves and take up the cross and follow me. And then, after Peter confessed that Jesus is the Messiah, and remember, Peter's, uh, uh, what is this implication? The understanding of the Messiah is a different Messiah. And so Jesus begins to open before his disciples uh, just where he is headed to a Roman cross. And then Peter said, you are not supposed to do that. Uh, Peter rebuked him. And yet Peter goes so far to rebuke Jesus. In his response to Peter, Jesus warned the disciples not to tell who he was. And Peter warned Jesus not to go down the path of suffering. And this led to a sharp rebuke from Jesus calling Peter Satan in verse 33. And so for, uh, for suggesting something that was not in accordance with the will of God. After this exchange, Jesus unfolds to his disciples and others with him what is involved in being a disciple. It says, sir, if you want to be my disciple, you must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. And then, followed in with, here is a, a continuation of that uh, section uh, in verse 35. For whoever wants to save their life, will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for his soul? And if anyone is ashamed of me and my words and his adulterous, sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Wow. So in its total self-denial, taking up the cross, following him, and what is surprising, however, is that the way in which Jesus supports his call to discipleship, and if you notice here, in 35 to 38, he points out the value of being a disciple, saving one's life by losing it, exchanging death for eternal life, and being unashamed when Jesus returns, in this light, self-denial is the path that brings true treasure and makes sense of what people typically think 
of as a foolish throwing away the worldly gain. And so, you know, Jesus, in this sense, really is making it very, very, uh, you know, hard. Because Peter said, you are not supposed to follow through in this suffering's path. And Jesus said, no, that is the way it should be. And so, uh, he then began to teach them that a son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests. So, the second phase of his teaching, Jesus' words were very clear. Rejection, death, and resurrection. But something explored, exploded in Peter's head. Lord, have mercy on you. In no way shall this happen to you. And of course, uh, Unknowingly, Peter was using the same tactic that Satan used in the wilderness. The easy way led Jesus to an earthly kingdom. The difficult one led him to achieve salvation on our behalf. And so, and that was not at all. His followers had to be willing to tread the same path, take up the cross, live and die, uh, live, live or die for the precious gift of salvation, helping others achieve it. Wow. And so that is really, uh, you know, uh, dramatic. Followers of Jesus are called to have the same goal he has, take the cross and follow him. On our uh, next section, teaching about the kingdom, on our Tuesday's section, uh, the mountain and the multitude. Here, uh, we are going to see, just like the early Christian, most of us do not experience anything similar to what Peter, James, and John shared with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. What was Jesus trying to achieve with this? In what sense is Jesus continuing and completing the task of Moses and Elijah? What does it mean for us today? To listen to Jesus in chapter 9, verse 7. How do we do that in our own context? Now, let's look at the text. And uh, Mark chapter 9, 1 to 13. And he said to them, Truly I tell you, some of you who are standing here will not taste death before they say that the kingdom of God has come with the power. And then after six days... Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up in a mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking to Je with Jesus. And Peter, Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, is it good for us to be here? Let us put up uh, three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, where they were so frightened. And then a cloud appeared and covered them. And a voice came from the cloud. And this is my son, whom I have loved. Listen to him. Now, of course, uh, the story of transfiguration and the encounter with the demon-possessed boy follows immediately after Peter's confession of uh, Jesus being the Messiah, explanation of the cause of the disciples. And then Jesus refers to some person who will not taste death, in verse 1, he said, and they, they see the kingdom, God after it has come with power. And this statement troubles some people because they think it suggests that the first century Christians expected Jesus to return. In their day, that even Jesus himself had not, you know, had that expectation. So, a comment from R. Ellen Cole, Alan Cole, I mean, and may be helpful at this juncture. The verse in verse nine, chapter nine, verse one, must therefore refer either to the transfiguration which follows immediately, after which seems reasonable, or to a later event still within a human lifespan such as Christ's triumph on the cross confirmed by the resurrection or to the coming of the Spirit during the Pentecost or to be a later extension of the blessings of the kingdom to the Gentiles. 
So Jesus had to uh, had told his disciples that there were some standing uh, there were some standing with him who should not this death till they should see the kingdom of God uh, come with power. At this transfiguration, this promise was fulfilled according to Elid White. And the countenance of Jesus was there changed and shone like the sun. His raiment was white and glistening. Moses present uh, to represent those who will be raised from the dead at the second appearing of Jesus and Elijah who was translated without seeing death, represented those who will ch- be cha- changed to immortality at Christ's second coming and will be translated to heaven without seeing death. And the disciples uh, beheld with astonishment and fear the excellent majesty of Jesus and the cloud overshadowed them and heard the voice of God and terrible majesty, this is my beloved son. Whom I love, listen to him. In verse 7. So, uh, three disciples, Peter, James, and John, witnessed the transfiguration. It is an unforgettable experience, Peter suggests, making a new tense, one for Jesus, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But then a cloud overshadows them, says this scene, reminiscent of God's descending on Mount Sinai, and proclaiming the Ten Commandments. And so here is uh, the next phase of that story, because uh, in the mountain, uh, suddenly, when they look around, they no, longer, they no longer say anyone with them except Jesus. Peter, uh, I mean Elijah and Moses is gone. After the God the Father being covered by clouds right in the mountain, Elijah and Moses is gone and heard the voice, This is my beloved son. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So here is again the gospel of secrecy. Jesus is trying to, you know, uh, not to tell anybody about what's happened there in the Mount Transfiguration. It doesn't tell us where the Mount Transfiguration is in the Bible. Uh, we do not know where it is. They kept the matter to themselves, discussing what rising from the dead meant. And as they ask, why do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? And Jesus replied, to be sure Elijah does come first and restore all things. Why then is it written that the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected? But I tell you, Elijah has come. And they have done to him everything they wished, and it is written about him. And so, uh, uh, the significance, the significance of the transfiguration, is its affirmation of Jesus, the Son of God. It confirms the disciples' faith that the crucifixion approaches, and the reader knows from the beginning of the gospel in chapter one, verse one. And it is important for three disciples to recognize Jesus' identity to help them weather the storm of passion. Because it says here that uh, they had sinned until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone. And so, uh, you know, uh, uh, this is now Jesus revealing to the three disciples, uh, do not tell anybody until I am resurrected. And you, so this is uh, you, uh, interesting, unique, in essence, uh, this is happening in Mark. And then in Mark, uh, uh, the mountain and multitude, and then we move on to the, the, the story here. As uh, uh, Jesus was telling the disciples, when they came to the, uh, to the other disciples, you mean the, the nine disciples left in, uh, at the foot of the mountain, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law, arguing with him. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with him about? He asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of a speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. 
He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I ask your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. And Jesus said, you unbelieving generation, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the, whole, uh, bring, bring the boy to me. So they brought him, and when the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into the convulsion. The, the, you know, the spirit, the, the evil spirit now, did not speak here. They were silent. And, into, and he fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. And then, uh, continued on, Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered, it has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for the one who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that the crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf mute spirit. Jesus is, uh, this, explained, this is now why the spirit uh, did not say anything because they were deaf and mute. In the previous encounter, the spirit talks, but here they are deaf and mute. I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And the spirit shriek, convulsed him violently and he came out and the boy looked so much like corpse that many said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. And Jesus had gone indoors. His disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this kind can come only by prayers. Wow. And so, you know, this is uh, uh, the idea in which... Uh, uh, at the base of the mountain, the scene is quite different uh, from transfiguration. Jesus encounters a demon-possessed boy and his father. Uh, to their embarrassment, the nine disciples who stayed behind at the base of the mountain could not cast the demon. Jesus responds by bemoaning of unbelief. Encountering unbelief after the mountaintop experience is not unlike Moses coming down from Mount Sinai and with Joshua encountering the Israelites worshiping the golden calf. Like Moses, Jesus will overcome the evil at the foot of the mountain and the boy that uh, Jesus encounters is possessed by unclean spirit. Six specific terms are used to describe the situation of the boy. It says here, number one, the spirit seizes the boy, throws him down, and then fumes at the mouth, grinds his teeth, and becomes rigid. And to those in medical field, uh, this is, sounds like a symptoms of epilepsy. But the gospel attributes the boy condition to a demon position. An interesting aspect of the story is that the attitude of the boy's father, he is overwhelmed by the disciples' failure to heal his son. And when he meets Jesus, his faltering hope, hope gives way to his plea. But if you can, see, if you can, in verse 23, uh, in, in verse 21, I mean, uh, and then says, as often as, if you can, in verse 22, do anything, pity on us and help us. And Jesus retorted, if you can, said Jesus, everything is possible. It is a sudden lightning bolt revelation to the father that the problem is not simply his son's condition, but his own faltering faith. He responds by casting himself on the Savior's mercy. I do believe, he said, help overcome my unbelief, in verse 24. The, the story has an important lesson. Our place in the ministry is not simply to be with Jesus on the mountaintop and the communion with God. It is also down in the valley with the real people suffering real problems. 
Our calling is not just simply to share the gospel message, but also to live with, by the practicing principle of love and mercy of God. Some people maybe have weak faith, but when we help them, it increases their faith. Wow. And so uh, that is uh, Tuesday's uh, section in which uh, Peter, James, and John were not fully aware of their glimpsing of the mountain, the kingdom of glory, the miniature representation of the second coming of Jesus. Uh, they were clear about what they wanted to stay there. And then, but at that moment, they did not perceive the true meaning of the words that Moses and Elijah spoke to Jesus. So that the dead in Christ represented by Moses and the living faithful and the last generation represented by Elijah could enter the glory of Jesus had to die in Jerusalem. Upon descending from the mountain, the, the, present the gospel of the kingdom, the lack of faith endangered the very structure. The apostles lacked faith and the desperate father had lost confidence. With faith, everything is possible. But if you lack faith, cry out like the Father, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. Wow. So he says, the Father says, I believe, help my unbelief. Now on our Wednesday section, <clears throat> who is the greatest? Now in the next sequence, we will again have the pattern of Jesus suffering loss the disciples seeking gain and the, and the need of, for repentance. Can you identify them? How does the second round help us understand what is going on here? Let's look at the text. Mark 9, 30 to 37. They left that place. No, where they held the, the uh, <coughs> demon-possessed boy. And that they left the place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were. Because he was teaching his disciples, he said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant, and were afraid to ask him about it. And they came to Capernaum when he was in the house. He asked them, What were you arguing about in the, on the road? And says, uh, uh, you know, and, and the, the next verse here is that, uh, but they kept quiet because on the way, they arg had argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, anyone who wants to be first must be the last and the servant of all. He took a little child whom he placed among them, taking them in his arms, he said to them, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. Wow. So Christ gave his disciples a most important lesson in regard to the, who should be his disciples. In the kingdom that I am about to sit up, he said, strife and supremacy shall have no place. All ye are brethren, all my servants, he shall be equal. Only greatness recognized, there will be the greatness of humility and devotion to the service of others. He that humbled himself shall be exalted, and that exalted himself shall be abased. He who seeks to serve others by self-denial and self-sacrifice will be given attributes of the character and command of God and develop wisdom through patience, forbearance, which is the fruit of the Holy Spirit, to give him chief place in the kingdom of God. And the Son of Man humbled himself to become the servant of God. He submitted to abasement and self-sacrifice, even to death, to give freedom and life and place the kingdom of those who believe in him. He gave his life as a ransom for many, and this should be enough to make those who continually seeking to be the first and striving supremacy ashamed of their course. According to Ellen White, that's This Day with God, uh, page 356. So, in this idea, the greatest in the kingdom is that Jesus begins his way down Jerusalem from Caesarea, stopping at Capernaum. 
Now remember, Kapendaom, it was his home base. He takes advantage of this period to instruct and prepare his disciples. And by, by, but the far from understanding what Jesus wanted to teach them, disputed who would be the greatest when Jesus proclaimed himself king in Jerusalem. And so uh, the first teaching, it says here that taking a child, he states greatness in the kingdom. The first are the last and the greatest is a servant. The smallest and the humbler must be treated as were Jesus himself. And in the second phase is that, uh, it says here, that second phase, that everything has their part to do and no one should be left behind when doing God's work, no matter how small. Wow. And so uh, in our uh, helping those in Christian service, even in small ways, does not go unnoticed in heaven. Now here is our last section on a Thursday. A healthy man in hell. What? A healthy man in hell. <laughs> I'm going to read Mark 9, 42 to 50. What ties the teaching of Jesus together in this passage? Mark 9, 42 to 50. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for him if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed with two hands and go to hell, where there the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and have thrown into the hell. What? what? Now, so this is kind of comedic. And if your eyes causes you to stumble, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where the worms that eat them do not die and the fire is not quenched. Everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if it loses saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt among yourselves and be at peace with each other. Wow, this is kind of, in closes, uh, at the close of chapter 9, Jesus touches on two concepts that trouble people, verses 40 to 50. And one is the idea of cutting off a hand or foot or plucking out the eye. If it causes a person to sin, should this command be taken literally? And the other is the issue of what appears to be an eternal burning hell where the worms that eat them do not die and the fire do not quench. And so the two problem texts are an example of Jesus using hyperbole and comedy to make a point. Jesus is not teaching self-mutilation. This was rejected in Judaism. Instead, he is illustrating that we should prefer to lose a hand a foot or an eye rather than to commit a sin. Sin is serious, serious business and we should avoid it. The comedy appears in the continuation of Jesus' example of drastic surgery by speaking of lame, blind, and disfigured people entering heaven because they cut away sin from their lives. While healthy people with both eyes, both hands, and both feet go to hell. Again, it is not literal picture, but a comedic expression of tragedy clinging to sin. It will ruin our lives. It is far better to lose the limb or an eye than go cling to sin. And so, you know, this is, uh, how do we know this is not literal picture? Because those who enter the heavenly kingdom will be whole and healthy. According to Paul, at at at, you know, at a twinkling of an eye, we will become changed. We will be healthy and strong and perfect. And so the, the hyperbole and comedy help us to understand that what Jesus is making a point about the importance of abandoning sins. He is not recommending self-mutilation. Wow. And so uh, 
the ent- how to enter the kingdom is that uh, the huge stone around your neck and throw yourself in the sea, cutting off a hand, foot, and gouging out an eye, strange ways to save yourself, right? If we take these words literally, as many do uh, with the face, the worms that eat them do not die, and the fire is not quenched, we have to reach the following conclusion. The redeemed will, have, will live eternally with a mutilated body. The wicked will suffer eternally, but at least their body will be whole. Uh, the lessons from this exaggeration is obvious. Sin is so terrible that you must flee from it immediately. Abandoning sin is hard and cost sacrifice. But the result is worth it and gives us peace. Wow. And so uh, that is, uh, here is my last uh, slide. Every true self-sacrificing worker for God is willing to spend and be spent for the sake of others. Christ says, he that loveth his life shall lose it. For he that li- hated his life in this world shall keep it in, unto life eternal. By earnest, thoughtful efforts to help where help is needed, the true Christian shows his love for God and for his fellow beings. He may lose his life in this service, but when Christ comes to gather his jewels to himself, he will find it again. Selected Messages, Book 1, page 78. So that is our presentation tonight, and be, I mean this morning, and let's, let's uh, close with the prayer. Dear Lord, thank you again for this lesson, giving us an insight of your becoming a disciple, uh, following you in your footsteps. I know, Lord, that it is sometimes hard, but worth doing it. And may it be that as we pursue and ponder upon these lessons of discipleship, uh, about your teachings, may it be, Lord, that we will gain insight and be accepted into your kingdom because you love us so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.